Welcome to EnviroCenter's Green Room, Ottawa's climate action podcast, where we dive into local climate solutions and chat with the people making them happen. Hi, I'm Mimi. Welcome to season two of EnviroCenter's Green Room podcast. This season, we're going to dive a little deeper into what needs to be done to reach Ottawa's climate targets. But before we can do that, we need to know what those climate targets are. So in today's episode, we're going to chat with Sharon Coward, EnviroCenter's Executive Director, to demystify our city's climate targets and figure out what we need to do to achieve them. All right. Hi, Sharon. Thank you so much for joining us today on The Green Room. Um, we're going to take a deep dive into Ottawa's climate targets. So thanks for coming. I'm excited to chat. Thank um, you. It's great to be here. So can you start by introducing yourself to our listeners? I can. I'm Sharon Coward, and I am the executive director of EnviroCenter, and we're the folks that run this podcast. And so our mission is to help residents of Ottawa, essentially people, families, businesses, and communities to take concrete action to reduce climate impact. So essentially, we try to take the information, practices, and technologies that are available out onto the streets and get real solid emissions reductions and impact reductions happening right here in town. The focus of our work is in four core areas, and they are green homes, green transportation, green business, and green city. We run more than 22 sustainability programs, and we work in all kinds of areas. So what I do in particular is spend a lot of time tracking what is happening in climate, what solutions are working on the ground, what solutions are not working but could be, and what problems maybe don't yet have practical solutions but need to. And then I work with our team and partners to do the work to get those solutions happening on the ground. We ask all of our guests uh, kind of to start off the interview with um, something fun. We ask for one fun environmental fact. So what is one fun environmental fact you'd like to share with us today? Yeah, okay, well, so fun maybe useful. This might not be the most fun fact, but it's a really useful one to have at your fingertips. Um, here in Canada, we often hear it bandied around the idea that our emissions don't matter. Despite the fact that we have one of the highest per capita footprints in the world, globally, we account for 2% or less of global emissions. Um, I, I realize none of this is fun yet. We're gonna get there. So there are around 195 countries in the world. And five of them account for about 55% of emissions. And so that's true. But the other 190 countries of which we are one account for 2% of global emissions or less each. And that adds up to 45% of total emissions. And 185 of those countries out of the 190 have less total emissions than Canada. So all this to say, that if all the countries in the world who create less emissions or equal emissions as Canada decided that they didn't matter, we would be ignoring 45% of the world's emissions. So that is a really long way to say that everyone in every country matters. So let's get into Ottawa's climate targets. Can you help paint a picture for someone who isn't familiar with Ottawa's climate targets? What are they and what do we need to do to achieve them? I realize this is a pretty big question. Yeah, no, absolutely, though. I, I think and talk about this all the time. So in some ways, climate targets are really simple these days to the point that every person, even if they're five years old, should be able to say what they are. So basically, everyone everywhere is gunning for net zero carbon emissions by 2050. And that's because that's what we've identified as a world to be what we need to stay under 1.5 degrees of warming and avoid catastrophic climate change. Or anyway, it's one of the things that we need. And so Ottawa's targets align with that as do Canada's. So in the simplest sense in Ottawa, our target is zero emissions by 2050, which is super easy, right? Um, but how we achieve them and, and how, we, how we get there is a little bit more complicated. So just to dig into that a little bit, the first more complicated piece is pace. So we do need to get to net zero emissions in Ottawa by 2050, but we need to do most of that work well in advance of 2050. And, and that's for a couple of reasons. One of them is that you can't do that level of work in a few years. So you have to be building up to it and doing a, doing a lot in advance. And also it's, it's better to do our emissions reduction work sooner 
because the cumulative emissions over all of those years when you've done really good work, say in 2025, is much higher. So it's much, much more worthwhile in terms of meeting our targets. But just to look at the pace we have to go. So, so remember, it's 100% by 2050. But by 2040, we have to be 96% of the way toward that target. So that's 18 years from now. And even closer than that, 2030, which is only eight years away, we're gunning for a target of 68% reduction in our emissions. So, so it's a much it's a much bigger issue than waiting till 2050 to, to hit 100% emissions reduction. And then the second complicated or more complicated part is where specifically do our emissions come from? And we're asking that so that we can identify where we need to make reductions. And so here in Ottawa, 45% of our emissions come from the built environment and almost the same amount, 44% come from transportation, which means our targets really mean massively reducing in those areas in particular and focusing on those areas. So we're talking about cars, trucks, buses, literally all the ways we get around in the city, getting all of those things to zero emissions. And then we're talking about the energy that we use heating and cooling our homes, our offices, our warehouses, all of those buildings, getting all those emissions to zero. And so we're talking about doing all of that essentially in 18 years by 2040. That's the 68% mark and, and sorry, no, that's the 96% mark and then 68% of it in just eight years this decade by 2030. So that gives you a sense of the, the pace and the scale of the task that we're taking on. But in the most basic, simple sense, what we need to do to achieve these targets is rapidly scaling up renewable sources of electricity, massively improving the energy efficiency of everything that we use, and then electrifying everything. Okay, thank you for that breakdown. I think the, the thing about the scale that really puts things in, the urgency of things into perspective for me is the 2030 targets because yeah. they're less than 10 years away. So it really does give you a sense of like the immediacy with which we need to act. It um, does. And for, for those of us in the climate movement, we've been looking at those 2030 dates for a while. Um, but here we are now in 2022 when it's, it's less than a decade away. So you're absolutely right. That really highlights the urgency. Yeah. So <laughs> I think um, one of the questions that we often come to when we start to talk about like effectively how to get to achieving these targets is what needs to be done at a systems level versus what can people get involved with themselves right now and I think sometimes these things get turned into a binary but like it is obviously all kind of connected but yeah what what do we need to do at a systems level versus what can people start to get involved in immediately yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And as you know, we encounter that at Enviro Center all the time because we have a lot of focus on practical action, um, which can be equated with individual action. Um, and so people will ask us, you know, how much does this matter? Is it really my responsibility or is it a systemic issue? And it's a really important thing to address. And I think these two things, the systemic and the and what people can do right now, they're really tied up together because while there are many, many things that individuals and families and businesses can do on their own right now, um, from things like reducing meat consumption to buying less and just in everything, um, to walking and cycling and taking transit, to deciding to turn down the heat a little bit in your home over the winter. Um, folks can do all these things, but some of the, the big ones with a lot of impact are really very expensive. They're hard, um, they might be complicated or they're easy to, to mess up the process. And so it, it doesn't make sense to leave folks to figure out how to get all of this right on their own or in fact, how to pay for it all. Um, so, so yeah, I'm gonna highlight some of the highest impact things that you can do to drop your climate footprint here in Ottawa. But then I'm gonna talk for a minute about how to make that possible for everyone. So it's gonna touch on really both of these questions. So at EnviroCenter in shorthand, we've boiled it down to the top three things you can do here in Ottawa to reduce your impact. So number one, net zero your home. Number two, net zero your travel. And number three, push for systemic change in one area that matters to you. So that sounds really easy, but it's, it's maybe not that simple. So I'm gonna dig into each, each area a little bit more. So the first one being 
net zero your home. And that, that really means bringing your home emissions down to zero carbon. So we're gonna hearken back to the statistic I mentioned that 45% of Ottawa's emissions come from buildings. And a, and a chunk of that is the homes that we live in. And we can cut those emissions by improving our homes to be energy efficient and then electrifying them so that they draw on 100% clean energy. And in broad strokes, as we've mentioned several times, and we're gonna keep saying to drive this home, we need to do all of this by 2040, which means roughly 20,000 of us here in Ottawa need to do this this year, and then every single year until we're done. So that's, that's a huge pace, a huge number of us that need to take action. And this is something that, that you can do, you can do with your home. It's something that you can talk about with your friends, your family, your neighbors, your landlords and your city councillors and get them thinking about doing it and also get them thinking about what the obstacles are and, and how they can help you to, to move forward in that area. So that's the first big one. The second one is zero carbon your travel, which just makes sense because the other big bucket of emissions in Ottawa comes from transportation. That's the 44% bucket. And this is largely our gas burning single occupancy cars beetling around town to do all the things we do, to work, to shop, to live. All of these trips need to go to 100% electric or zero carbon by 2050. So that means a few things. That means your next car, if you choose to buy one, is electric. It means that this electrified public transit system that Ottawa is struggling to build, it really matters. It means that any trips that you can shorten or eliminate or do via zero carbon means like walking, rolling, pedaling, all of that stuff will make a difference. Today, our lives here in Ottawa are really largely built around nonstop gas powered journeys and tomorrow's trips cannot be. So what you can do today is start doing the work of figuring out how to zero carbon your travel for tomorrow's world. And then number three. So this one is really quite hard to choose because the remainder of Ottawa's emissions are divided across a wide range of important things. And then there's biodiversity, resilience, habitat loss, um, the global community's emissions profile, all of these things to consider. But what all of these things have in common is the need for significant systemic change to shift the tide. And so that's that's number three, push for systemic change. And that's really big and not everybody is really ready to take that on as a address every single issue kind of thing. Uh, so here's what we suggest. When you're pondering the climate damaging pieces of your life that you feel you can't fix. So for instance, the mountains of plastic that come with all of our food supplies, or maybe the questionable production methods behind your new t-shirt or your shoes or the habitat destruction that's associated with the beef that goes into your absolute favorite meal. So when you're thinking about these things where you know your life has impact, focus on one and then start to ask those people or companies or the individuals behind the companies who can make a difference to change their ways. So you as one person, you probably can't, you definitely can't address every part of the big picture. It's huge, but you are not alone. And one million Ottawa residents, because there's about a million of us here, making their voice heard on one big climate issue each is a big force for change. So start small, focus into one thing that matters to you and push for systemic change in that area. Yeah, I think that's one of the best ways to kind of not feel overwhelmed with the the huge scale of it is to sort of pick one thing or kind of go one at a time and just um, focus in on one area that you really care about and trying to influence change there. We are currently living in the most important decade for climate change. So between now and, and 2030, we really have to do a huge amount of change. So um, one of the statistics that I read in, um, in Ottawa's climate change master plan was that uh, we need to reduce community emissions by five to 6% every year for the next five years. And um, I just wanted to ask you, what do you think we need to do to reduce um, emissions by five to 6% every year? Yeah. How do we do that? <laughs> yeah, no, it's a lot. And, and just to say that there are some actual, there are some real specifics in that plan that make recommendations of what we can do in Ottawa. It's worth, it's worth checking out. Um, 
But from a high level, what I would say is we have to do everything and really fast. Um, I really can't emphasize that enough. We missed the boat on incremental change sometime around 1990. <laughs> so if we want to hit the targets that we have both here in Ottawa and, and globally, there is no easing in, not anymore. Um, we need to do all the things and we need to do them at a pace that, that maybe doesn't feel intuitively safe or reasonable even. Um, we need to rapidly scale up renewables, for instance. We need to retrofit our homes and buildings to maximum energy efficiency. We need to transition our transportation systems, as I've mentioned, all of them to electric and, and massively improve our public transit systems, both in terms of electrification, of course, and also in terms of usage. We need to rapidly deal with the organics that we're sending to the landfill. We need to get them diverted and collected and, and processed. And, and then we need to expand our waste management to, to capture all of the landfill emissions that are created from our waste. We need to do things like plant trees, rewild our lawns and our public spaces. Really, we need to do all the things. So that's obviously a, a very big ask. Um, so I'm gonna narrow down a little bit. So. The thing that we really need to understand and, and get on board and support is, is how quickly we need to do this and understanding that we need to do this fast and we need to spend an enormous amount of money on it in a short period of time. Now, that money, that spending is going to pay back in energy savings, in jobs, in improved air quality that reduces healthcare spending. We've already seen that happen in Ontario in avoided climate damages from storms, floods, and, and other kinds of crises, this, this money will more than pay itself back. And if it's done right, it will bring enormous community benefits besides that. But we need to spend it now. We need to spend money retrofitting our homes beyond what the average homeowner will be comfortable spending, for instance. We need to transform our transit systems beyond what the average municipal bureaucrat or counselor is going to feel comfortable spending. We're gonna to need to dig in and look at this whole thing as a big collective project. This isn't radicalism speaking. This is, this is just practical reality for the place that we're at right now. If we want a livable world, we're going to need to get comfortable with spending the kinds of sums that will get this work done this decade, today, tomorrow, and then really digging in to make it happen. Just the reality of how quickly and how much effort needs to be put in and how much money needs to be put in over the next, um, like in the short term is, is something that is a big challenge to kind of wrap our heads around and accept and uh, encourage our leaders uh, to also accept and wrap their heads around, but to kind of focus in a little bit on um, back onto the kind of solutions and side of things. Um, what are some of the projects and solutions that are currently underway in Ottawa that people should keep an eye on um, to get involved in, I guess? Yeah, well, that's a good news story because here in Ottawa, there is work underway in all of these areas. And I'm gonna go through some and there's, there's many more, but um, the city of Ottawa, for instance, has has tree planting targets and programs and is, is underway developing a solid waste management strategy that should address organics diversion across the region. The now quite well-known Better Homes Ottawa program and our own program at Enviro Center, Future Homes Ottawa, um, a retrofit pilot project. These address residential retrofits and there is a new retrofit accelerator program that has just been launched through the city of Ottawa to start engaging with commercial buildings. Um, Ottawa Community Housing, which is the largest social housing provider in the region, recently partnered with Natural Resources Canada to pilot the installation of modular external siding on one of their townhouse developments in the popular energy sprung model. And this was mentioned in Canada's recently released emissions reduction plan. We at Enviro Centre have a business sustainability program and we run loads of active transportation programs. Ecology Ottawa promotes green infrastructure and planting of native trees and, and really keeps on the city of Ottawa to be forward thinking in their, in their approaches to climate. Um, Hydro Ottawa is a great example. They are investing in renewables via Portage Power, 
which is Ontario's largest municipally owned producer of green power, including hydroelectric, solar, landfill gas to energy facilities that, that actually generate enough renewable electricity to power 107,000 homes annually. Um, just to go back to our transit system, the light rail will be low carbon and we're purchasing electric buses. Um, EnviroCenter and the City of Ottawa and the Electric Vehicle Council of Ottawa and, and some other partners are working together on an electric vehicle promotion program. Um, there are so many things. I, oh, another one I want to highlight is the Ottawa Renewable Energy Co-op. They support local investment in renewables. There is there's so much going. There's so many other projects as well that I that I haven't even touched on there. There's a lot going on on the ground, and these are all really good important things. And as I said, more than I can actually mention here. Um, but the other side of that story is that they're all small and incredibly low impact compared to what needs to be happening. So even the sum of all of these parts, unfortunately, today falls massively short of what we need to do. So even more than keeping an eye on these initiatives, which which is great, I, I would ask any listener to, to look them up. Um, and, and jump into the conversation, but, but really jump into the conversation about expanding and massively scaling these initiatives, because that really is the project of today. Yeah, I think one of the most important parts of finding a way to take action is, um, is understanding better what the initiatives are that are already happening. And therefore you can kind of jump in more actively into like asking and trying to push for ways to scale them up. So I guess my next question is, what are some of the biggest challenges to achieving our climate targets in Ottawa? Yeah, so there are a lot of specific challenges, but I guess to summarize, the biggest ones I'd probably say are cost and then the lack of creative big thinking around these solutions. So. Shifting our local system and our world system off fossil fuels and unsustainable waste is, it is genuinely a complete rebuild of the system. So I've touched on this a little bit earlier, going back to it again, it will be very expensive. It will be the kind of expensive that our governments are afraid of. It's the kind of expensive that goes way beyond what is considered in Canada's new action plan, for example, which, which in itself is probably the best of its kind that we've seen. Um, but it doesn't, it doesn't reach that level of spending that we need. But we also know that the cost of doing nothing and weathering the impacts of climate, climate change will be much more expensive than that level of spending and also destructive. So today we have a choice. We can spend an admittedly enormous amount now building a better system and building a world that works, or we can spend an even more enormous amount later trying to clean up the mess that we left. And in the first case, we save ourselves and our families grief and suffering, and, and we stand a chance of keeping a sustainable world. So that's the first scenario. And in the second one where we wait, we spend a spectacular amount on a cleanup project that will ultimately fail. So it's a very sad story, obviously. Yeah, that's not where we're getting for. Um, the trouble is that we're our society is really built to be quite reactionary. Um, Using healthcare as an example, the most expensive way to deal with healthcare is to wait until a person's condition is bad enough to be hospitalized, to need surgery, to need expensive drugs and long-term care. The cheapest way is to provide excellent preventative care across a person's lifetime. And yet in our system, the vast majority of our funds still go towards the expensive choice, crisis care, and, and often to the detriment of lifetime preventative care which many folks currently can't get, which means we're constantly in crisis and expensively trying to plug big gaping crisis holes. Well, the same goes for climate, but the trouble is in this case, if we wait for the crisis care moment, the absolute crisis care where we're struggling to grow food and keep our populations alive, if we wait for that, it will be too late to reverse the path that we're on. So we need to wrestle with that deeply ingrained approach to crisis and, and really also to government spending. We need to embark on a massive transition project and fast. And that project will need to be funded massively, not in, not in trickles and dribs and drabs. 
and it will make itself back in growing new economies, energy savings, health improvements, avoided disasters, of course, um, but a huge spend needs to happen now. And, and in reality, right now, no government is willing to do it or honestly able and, and no government will be able to do that until their people want them to and specifically want them to. So it, it's not enough in 2022 to tell the government that Canadians want action on climate. We will get action on climate. It will, we'll get the kind of action that will see a 1% reduction in global emissions by 2040 when we need 50% plus. We need today to get really specific. So Canadians need to understand and ask for a massive infrastructure transition project that will cost billions. We need to support that spending and demand it and, and then really work like hell to make sure it is money well spent. No government can or will do that of their own accord. And the reality is no government will last doing it unless they have strong committed support from their electorate. So, so Canadians need to see our climate literacy jump and fast. We need to, we need to get it to get the issues and we need to understand where we are and ask for the right things. And I, I really want to reiterate that, that this spending is not a black hole that sucks money. This is spending that will reduce pollution, build energy resilience, improve the quality of our homes. And if it's done right, it's spending that will empower poor communities, create good jobs, and improve the equity and accessibility of our cities for all residents. This is building a better world. And we need to recognize sooner rather than later that this better world, this livable world, is not going to build itself just powered by market forces, um, not on the timeline we need, and certainly not if we want to come out looking anything resembling equitable. Um, so, uh, given that understanding the issues and staying up to date with what's going on with climate is one of the most important ways that people can continue to push for really strong climate action. How can people stay informed about whether climate targets are being met and what action is being taken and how can they get involved? Yeah, that, that's another big question in, a, in an interview filled with big questions. How do you stay informed and understand whether targets are being effectively met for what is unquestionably one of the most complex multi-factor global problems that we've ever encountered. So climate scientists, modelers, lawmakers, leaders, professionals all over the world struggle with this question. Um, so it is a real challenging one, but I'm going to give three answers of ways that the average person can, can take a look at this. So first, a really easy answer. You can know how various levels of government are doing on their stated targets just by tracking their annual reporting. So the City of Ottawa reports annually with, with a status update on the Climate Change Master Plan, which includes results of the annual GHG inventories and the five-year priorities. At the federal level, the, the federal government has committed to reporting annually on the new emissions reduction plan, as well as the annual national inventory report that is required for the global agreements. And then, of course, there are also global organizations who track the progress of countries independently, which is really good to look at as well to get a sense of what how an out, outside body might might assess our progress. Um, the second way, though, arguably, if you want to know if we're winning or losing the climate battle to reduce global emissions, in some ways, the number that matters most, or at least is simplest, is carbon parts per million. Um, so that's that's the level of carbon that's that's in our atmosphere. And you can find that number by Googling it. There's a lot of different sites. One of them is, is CO2.earth. Um, it'll give you a sense of where we're at and then how that compares and where we need to be. Um, both of these things give you a sense of the urgency of the problem and tells you which big areas you can ask your leaders, your friends, neighbors, and family to support for, for climate change and climate action. None of that tells you a lot about the day-to-day -day or what to do day-to-day -day, though. So one other way that you can use is, is to use your own life as a bar. So think about, is it possible for you to live your daily life, to, to get your kids to school, to feed your family, to have a job, visit your friends, without creating carbon emissions or excessive waste. And so look at this not as a hypothetical, um, you know, would it be possible if you had all the money in the world and a small holding farm, but 
is it actually possible in your real life? And if the answer is no, then we're not there yet. If the answer is somewhere around, good God, I'm one of the top per capita emitters in the world, just living a regular day, then you know we still have a long way to go. And, and here in Canada, that's honestly pretty likely because we are one of the top per capita, per capita emitters in the world. Um, that's not on you, or at least not entirely. For sure, you can make choices, and, and please do. But you're also enmeshed in a system that means your choices only go so far. Um, if you think you can't get your kids to school or feed your family without burning a whole pile of carbon and creating a tower of packaging waste every week, chances are so does everybody else. Um, if that's improving, we're heading in the right direction. If not, we're not. Using your own life as a bar is definitely a good, um, a good way to kind of, I guess, assess how much systemic change we've been able to collectively push for. Yeah. And because if, if, uh, if it's not easier for you individually to, to act in a different way, it's because we collectively haven't figured out a way to make it easier for all of us. Um, but uh, to end on a positive note, I think that one of the most important ways to continue to feel motivated around climate action is to focus on imagining the good climate future we're looking to build. So I'm going to ask you uh, the last question of our interview today. Um, what is the good climate future here in Ottawa? Yeah, it's a great question. And I completely agree that I think a big part of us getting to a good future is to be able to see where we're going and, and have a have a picture of it. And lots of the things that I'm gonna talk about in what I think is the, is the good future, um, these are things that we know how to do. And it's we're not talking science fiction here. We're, we're talking fields that have been explored and people have lots of experience. They've, been, they've piloted, they've got these things working in other cities. And so these are really practical things that you can do. Um, there are many aspects to a good future because we are in Center. I'm gonna focus on the good future being zero carbon. Um, there's, there's so much more to it, but we're gonna start there. So in the good future, our homes are powered by low carbon renewable energy, a large part of which is produced in the local region. So that means we have energy efficient homes that use as little energy as possible for day-to-day -day life. And this is good for a variety of reasons. One of them being that it means our, our homes are more resilient. We have backup power and maybe we have resilient microgrids to keep us safe and warm in the storms that are definitely coming, even in the best climate scenario. Our transportation is electrified and inclusive of everyone. We've recognized that energy efficient, equitable transportation is not primarily car based. So people have cars, but most of the time they prefer not to use them because transit is cheaper, safer, convenient, fast and popular. It's genuinely more fun. So car, pedestrian and bike accidents are way down and Ottawa is incredibly proud of our better than best in class transit system. Our lawns and parts of our driveways and huge sections of paved areas, including parking lots that we no longer need, have been planted with native species, trees and food. So our city, despite the fact that its population is pretty big, is full of life shade, places to play, beautiful things to look at. People do a lot of walking and cycling to get around their neighborhoods, which means on the whole, people are healthier and even happier than they used to be because of getting out of the community into the fresh air, getting exercise. Healthcare costs are down. We still have in all likelihood an enormous amount of goods circulating within our city and in and out of our city. But because of standardized containers and packaging and advanced waste sorting and organics processing systems, waste is down. And water, the city recognized early that water was going to be both a boon and a problem around here with climate change. And so we dug in and developed innovative systems to capture and store stormwater and flood season overflow to create reservoirs that would act as irrigating systems in the hot pieces of the year. Our use of ecological design for wastewater treatment systems has both reduced our costs and improved the river system health. And since many of these investments were supported by the federal and provincial climate transition fund, they had built in reconciliation, equity and community benefits requirements. Um, 
So the projects have boosts, have supported a boost in regional skilled labor and gradually built a regional shared expectation of a good base standard of living for all. And that's just the beginning. What a beautiful picture of Ottawa's climate future. Um, I'm so excited to continue working towards building that and making it happen. Um, thank you so much, Sharon, for coming on and chatting with me today. We really dived into a lot of uh, deep and intense questions. So thank you so much. Um, and hopefully uh, we will have clarified some questions and probably created more questions for our listeners, which we will continue to try and find solutions for throughout the rest of this season of The Green Room. <laughs> for sure. Thank you so much for having me. That's it for this week's Green Room. Thank you so much for joining us as we get to the heart of climate action. You can find out more about our work and sign up for our newsletter at envirocenter.ca. Follow us on your favorite podcast app or subscribe on YouTube.